Good afternoon and welcome to the special fireside chat with Tim McClyman, President of the American Express Foundation and Senior Vice President for Co Corporate Social Responsibility at American Express. In his role, Tim directs the company's global philanthropy, sustainability, and employee engagement programs. As one may conclude from his bi bi biography, Tim has embodied what some may describe as a renaissance framework, the pursuit of excellence across several diverse domains. Prior to American Express, Tim was the executive director of Second Stage Theater in New York City. He has also served as the executive director of the AT&T Foundation, where he directed global philanthropy and citizenship programs. Tim has also worked as a lawyer specializing in not-for-profit corporate law. He serves on a number of boards, including Americans for the Arts, Independent Sector, Mark Morris Dance Group, and Second Stage Theater. In addition to industry, Tim impacts the academy. He is an adjunct professor at NYU, where he teaches graduate courses in arts management. He is also a lead faculty member for the Institute for Corporate Respons Social Responsibility at Johns Hopkins University. On the American Express Corporate Resol Social Responsibility web pages, you will also see Tim's biweekly blogs on corporate social responsibility. You may also find his regular contributions to Forbes on topics such as the intersection of grassroots movements and philanthropy. We are certainly excited to hear from you today, Tim, in person. And again, please welcome Tim McClyman. Thank you. Thank you. I wish my daughter had been here to listen to that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we get started, Tim, one of the first questions I would like for you to talk about is how do you define a good leader? And, and to that, what are some of the most important attributes of a successful leader? Uh, well, I was thinking about this uh, while I was listening to your session this morning. Uh, I had thought about it before um, I got here, but I actually changed my mind about a couple of things uh, th this morning. You know, those of you that have been to a Leadership Academy program uh, in New York and have heard Ken Chenault, who was our former CEO uh, at American Express, he always talked about, uh, he always quoted Napoleon uh, in his definition of, of leader. Uh, and Napoleon, to paraphrase, uh, Napoleon said the uh, definition of a leader is someone who can define reality and give hope. Um, so I always thought that was sort of an interesting uh, concept and, and actually Ken kind of lives that concept. You know, he really is interested in the fact that, you know, you have to be able to accept reality and that reality isn't always given to you. Uh, on a plate, you know, uh, your, the people who work with you and for you aren't ne necessarily telling you reality. They're telling you what you want to hear often. So you have to do some investigating to find out reality. And also then giving hope is important um, as well, and that's how you marshal um, resources. But, but that's not my definition of leadership. It's just that, that I think it's an interesting way of looking at leadership. I tend to look at leadership maybe in a little more practical sense. And then I think that leaders, first of all, need a purpose, right? And whether you call it a vision or a mission or ideal, uh, a passion, you can call it a lot of different kinds of things, but you need some kind of, of purpose um, that you're going toward, that you're willing to go toward, you know? So you, you, need, to go, you need to know where do you want to go? Um, and then you need a plan uh, to get there. So and whether you call that plan a strategy, or you call it plan goals or objectives or priorities. You can call it lots of different kinds of things. But you need, I think leaders need a plan uh, as a way of achieving uh, that purpose. And they need people. Uh, it's hard to just lead yourself, uh, although some people do that. You know, but you need some people that are willing to follow you or have been assigned to follow you. Um, uh, but you need some people uh, that are, are part of of your resource and you need to be able to marshal uh, those people to, to stick to the strategy, stick to the plan in order to achieve um, the purpose. And then finally, I think you need uh, power. Uh, and power can come uh, in a lot of different ways. I mean, I was very struck this morning about the discussion of capital. Uh, capital is power, uh, property. Property is power, money. Talked about money, money is power. Uh, but it could just be people, 
right? So could, your power could come from your people and your collective, uh, both collective sense uh, and the collective work that you do uh, as a group of people or as a community. So I think that, that you know, purpose, you know, plan, people, uh, and power, so four Ps, um, are uh, things that really help define um, a leader. Now, in our own case at American Express, and I just recognize Richard Brown uh, here as part of my team. He's actually chosen to be part of my uh, team. I chose to come to work with us. Um, you know, I think that, that even at a big company like American Express, where you think you have all the resources in the world, we don't have all the resources in the world. We have money. Like, we have, a, we have a purpose. We think we have a purpose in our corporate social responsibility as a company. We certainly have a strategy. We have a plan. Uh, we, have, we have resources, financial resources, but we actually don't have a lot of people uh, in our corporate social responsibility group. We only have 10 people, and there are 60,000 people uh, in the company. So one of the things that we, you know, I, I'm always talking to my team about is how do we get more people to be part of our plan? How do we get more people involved, either at a grassroots level or an executive level, a geographic you know, level? How do you get more people uh, in so that we can achieve more because we need more people? We've got the other at, you know, attributes, but we need more people. I certainly can appreciate the four P's of leadership. We know the four P's of marketing, right? <laughs> You've given us a new way of thinking about it. But as you think about these four P's as potential values, can you speak to that as well as any other values that have played a role in your career or the companies where you have worked? Yeah, so I, you know, I grew up in Iowa. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest uh, in a very uh, Catholic family. Uh, so those things influenced me um, a lot. So you grow up in a, a place like Iowa, it, it has a real kind of salt of the earth mentality. We talked about a Protestant ethic, work ethic this morning. That Protestant work ethic really existed uh, in my community. It was all about hard work and personal responsibility. You know, if you work hard, you'll be able to achieve anything. Um, and so that was really instilled in us as kids. Um, and I think that Everybody in my family has, has worked hard. Uh, we've worked for everything. We haven't been given anything uh, along the way, so we've worked hard, and so that was really you know, instilled in us. But the fact that we were in a Christian family, and I, I can't say that all Christian families are like this, but our, in our Christian family, we were taught tolerance, uh, and so we were very tolerant to all kinds of people, uh, and we were taught kindness uh, as well. So we want to be kind toward other people and tolerant um, of other people. But uh, I was also a Boy Scout, uh, and I know Boy Scouts have gotten a bad rap, uh, but uh, being a Boy Scout, and I'm, I was an Eagle Scout, had a big influence on my life starting at you know, age 10 through 16. And there's a, you know, there's a Boy Scout law that's, you know, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Uh, I still remember Good those. <laughs> um, so I, and I can't say I've, I hit all of those. You know, the, like the, the first five or six are more in my, you know, my bailiwick, the trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous kind are things that really kind of spoke to me. And again, I kind of uh, try to lead my life uh, according to some of those uh, scouting laws. And then you mentioned, uh, I think, about be, uh, being prepared. Uh, you know, that's the Boy Scout uh, motto, is to be prepared. And, you know, I, I really, throughout my entire life, have lived um, that I've always wanted to be uh, prepared with uh, anything I do. Thank you for that. So when you think about these values and that element of preparation and trustworthiness and loyalty, how would you articulate your leadership philosophy? Well, Richard probably would be a better uh, person to talk about that uh, <laughs> since he's part of my team. But, but I, I think that I have a very inclusive uh, philosophy of leadership so that anyone is on, that's on the team is on the team. Uh, and even people who aren't officially on the team are part of the team. You know, so I, I, I tend to cast a wide net uh, and try to be as inclusive uh, as possible in, in different kinds of people, uh, different kinds of backgrounds, different points of view. Uh, and then I allow people to express those points of view. So it's a, it, it doesn't make any sense to have people that have different backgrounds and different cultures if you don't allow them to express those uh, points of view. So I think that we have a healthy, open, 
dialogue uh, as, as part of our team. But ultimately, somebody has to make the decision. Uh, and because ultimately, somebody is responsible, particularly when you're working in a corporate uh, environment. And so I ultimately have the deci decision making um, authority. But I, I tend to look at us like a team, even though I'm not a big sports fan. Uh, but I think the idea of teams where everybody has a job to do on the team, and everybody is as important, you know, if, you're, if it's football, the linemen is just as important as the quarterback, because if a lineman's not doing their job, you know, somebody's going to get to the quarterback so that he can't do his job. So, you know, you, everybody's got their job to do. Everyone is dependent on everyone else um, to do those jobs. Uh, and so I think you have to, as a leader, be able to marshal those resources that I talked about um, earlier to help your team achieve those plans uh, toward their purpose. But everybody's got a role, and all those roles are equal uh, roles in my mind um, anyway. And so I try to uh, function uh, in that way as part of the team. I truly appreciate the conversation around inclusivity and team and synergy and decision making. But what would you say are the big bets you've taken maybe before the team knew as you engage the team, what were some of those big Hiring risks? Richard was a really big bet. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I mean, I, I say that jokingly, but I'm, I'm pretty serious about that because I think that any hiring decision is a big bet. Like you are deciding to essentially, you know, get married uh, to someone, uh, particularly if you have a small team with relatively little information sometimes uh, about them. So I think hiring decisions are really incredibly important. But uh, to backtrack a little bit, I think the biggest bet that I've ever made is after I came to American Express, which was 12, 12 and a half years ago, I was brought in uh, as somebody who would make some changes, but not too many changes. Uh, like uh, maintain the things that were working well and discard and change the things that weren't working as well. And uh, as, as part of my uh, kind of listening tour, uh, if you will, I went and read all the speeches that our CEO had made through the, the five years before I got there. And one of the things that kept popping up in those speeches, the concept of leadership. So he talked about leadership a lot. And at the same time, uh, there was a study that the Bridgespan group did, which was called the leadership deficit. And the leadership deficit talked about the fact that a lot of nonprofit organizations in the United States had been founded by people who are now baby boomers. Those baby boomers were going to be retiring um, soon. There was going to be a real need for new leaders um, of nonprofit organizations. And they posited as part of that study that uh, the nonprofit sector would need to attract people from the for profit sector to help fill those positions. Um, I uh, agreed with the research, but didn't agree with the conclusion. So uh, I felt that there were plenty of leaders uh, inside nonprofit organizations who were, were poised to assume those roles, but perhaps they didn't have the skills or the training uh, or the professional development to be able to, to do that. So you know, in a place like American Express, you know, we have a lot of money and a lot of resource that's devoted to professional development. Like everybody has to help to help develop themselves. You as a leader have to, have to help develop your team. Uh, and we're really, really focused on high potential emerging leaders because those are the people that are going to be the future senior leaders um, of the company. And uh, quite honestly, you know, 12, 12 years ago, that didn't really exist in any degree in the nonprofit sector. So I, I literally just took the idea from the leadership, uh, the leadership deficit that there was a need for all these nonprofit leaders. And I took the interest that our CEO had uh, in leadership, and I knew that we as a company think of ourselves as a leader uh, and want to have an impact with what we do. Just married those things uh, and said, we're going to focus on uh, leadership development. Uh, and, you know, I went in and talked to my boss uh, about that after having developed this idea. And he looked at me and he said, shit, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so then I had to go, go sell it to our most senior uh, leaders in the company, and they got it right away. Like, they, they got the idea right away of something that they were committed to. Uh, they could see where there was a need 
for it. We had that community need. We could have an impact. Uh, and so we decided to do it. And that's when we brought Richard on uh, to help run the program. Uh, and so that was a really big uh, bet because I was brought in to be a change agent. Not too much of a change agent, but right. a change um, agent. So I needed to figure out something to do that you know, would be relevant for the company and consistent with our culture and our values and the way we saw ourselves uh, and also address our community need because I needed to, to you know, have a good reputation with the not-for-profit sector as well. So that was a, that was a big bet. It's paid off. You're all here uh, in this room. Richard is still here uh, it, with us. Um, and so over the last 12 years, we've you know, now spent you know, millions and millions of dollars of our shareholders' money uh, to help develop 70,000 uh, nonprofit leaders all over the world. Um, and so it's been a really successful um, effort, but it could have gone ar awry easily. Right. Yeah. And into that, if I may push just a little bit on your, the element of change agent and, and trying not to change too many things too quickly, when you think about what, what supported the success of your, your announcement or your efforts, what would you say were some early pitfalls that you saw and you navigated around? Or how might we as executive leaders or emerging leaders look out for the potential dangers that are associated with leading change? And what might you suggest we do? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is we took it really slow. Um, and so we didn't jump you know, right in the pool. Uh, we put, kind of put our foot in uh, and said, we're going we're gonna to test the waters, essentially. So we're going to uh, go out, work with nonprofit organizations, uh, and talk to them about leadership development and their own professional development. We're going to fund a few programs um, at the beginning that were focused on different kinds of leaders, and so we weren't sure uh, initially whether we wanted to focus at the CEO level or at the student level or you know at the, the middle management level, emerging level. We weren't quite sure of that um, at the beginning, so we tested a lot of different thing, uh, different approaches, um, and so it was really through that testing that we decided to focus on the emerging, uh, high potential emerging leader, and then I think we you know we came up with the idea. Uh, together and everything we do, we do together um, of, you know, the Leadership Academy and having, you know, a real sort of premier program uh, that would be devoted to leadership development. Uh, but we, you know, we did one program with 24 people um, in New York. We didn't do, two, you know, 20 programs. We did one program to test it, to sort of work uh, in partnership with the Cre uh, Center for Creative Leadership and really focus on you know, what the curriculum should be and what we wanted the outcomes um, to be, and then gradually expanded that program uh, to other countries um, and, and other cities. And then, you know, we, we seized opportunities uh, or, or focused on opportunities as they came along as well. So I, was, I had, I've told the story before to some people, but we had this great Leadership Academy program in place, but it was sort of focused on the traditional nonprofit leader who's in an organization and has people reporting to them. Uh, but I was, somebody was sitting in my office, Tammy Tibbetts, who had just founded her own organization. She was still working for a Seventeen magazine as the social media person, but she founded this organization called She's the First. And she was listening to me espouse all the wonderful things that we were doing, and she said to me, well, what do you have for me? <laughs> and I said, we don't have anything for you. Uh, and so I went to Richard, I said, we've got to do something for, you know, for social entrepreneurs or pe founders of um, organizations. So we developed a partnership with Ashoka uh, and developed a boot camp for social entrepreneurs, which we now have in four or five countries, uh, five countries, I think, around the world. Uh, and it's really focused on founders of organizations that could be both for-profit or not-for-profit or sort of hybrid. Uh, so that was kind of an opportunity that sort of presented itself um, to us uh, that we seized uh, upon. So I think that you know, taking things sort of gradually in steps and being what, and, and I've talked about this before um, too, Richard heard me talk of, uh, about being focused but flexible. So you've got to be focused on what it is that you want to do, what your end goal um, is, but you've got to be flexible enough to make changes 
um, along the way and to keep tweaking, keep improving, or to, to you know, to take an opportunity that somebody says to you, confronts you, right. says, what do you have for me? And go, hey, we don't have anything for you and we should. Um, and so you can't be so narrowly focused that you, you don't allow yourselves to do those kinds of, of things. So I think that being focused but flexible is also a part of it. And I appreciate that example because you're, you're speaking to why American Express is focused on leadership development and developing uh, pipelines. How would you describe what success looks like for, not, for this effort? Yeah, we've struggled with that. Um, and and I, I can't say that we've done as good a job uh, with that as I think we should. Um, and Richard and I talk about this um, a lot. We are, we're, we're very uh, f focused on individual projects. Like we can tell, and these are, these are by the way, bets that we're making, right? So we're betting on a partnership with an organization that they will help produce a, a project or a product that will be successful. Um, and so we're betting on them just like you're, you, we would bet in the stock market or you know, a bet in investing in anything. Um, and so we're doing our research and we're trying to you know, make those bets with the right people and the right um, organizations. So we are, one of, so one of the things we do is we insist as part of that effort that the organization come up with its own measures of success. So we're not gonna dictate what those measures of success um, should be. We're gonna let the organization tell us what their measures of success is, and then at the beginning of the project, and then they have to go back at the end of the project and repeat what those you know, objectives were and measures of success and tell us whether they were successful or not. Did they meet those? Um, uh, objectives, and they do that in the form of a report, and those reports are written, uh, are read by our program officers like Richard, and then our program officers have to rate them on a red, yellow, green um, scale that, you know, green, they met their objectives, you know, yellow, they sort of didn't, uh, but for good reasons, and red, they didn't, you know, they screwed up and didn't meet their objectives at all. Um, and so, in, so now we have a kind of system in place for tracking uh, those, but you know we've we've developed uh, along the way. We've also developed some things that we're really kind of focused on to be consistent from project to project, and particularly in our leadership academy uh, program. But I, but I don't think that we have we we're not there yet. We're still working. We're still struggling to come up with what the right scorecard or, or measures of success should be. And I'd love to switch gears a bit just to ask you some questions about your leadership story, and, yeah. and one being, what leader have you looked up to throughout your life? So I have a mentor, uh, his name is Randall Levy. Um, he is a, a, now retired, but when I first met him, I was working at the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington uh, as a program officer, uh, and he was one of our panelists. Uh, he was then the executive director of the 92nd Street Y um, in New York. He was a lawyer. Uh, or had a legal background, and uh, I kind of connected with him, and he connected with me because we'd have these meetings, these panel meetings, and no matter what question was asked of me, I knew the answer, because I was prepared. Right. Uh, <laughs> so I was prepared, I knew the answer, and he was like, well, this guy is prepared. Like, um, so, so we kind of connected, and he is the one that encouraged me to go to law school, uh, which I did, went to law school at night uh, at Georgetown while I was working uh, at the NEA. And then he encouraged me to you know, come to New York uh, to practice law uh, at a firm that was, uh, was dealing with nonprofit organizations. It was John Lindsay, the former mayor of New York, was his firm. Uh, and so I was recruited into that firm to work with nonprofit um, organizations. And then he, uh, he, uh, uh, by then was the president of the AT&T Foundation. Uh, he had a job open uh, and he recruited me into that job. I was like, no, 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 I, I, I just got done with law school and I'm practicing law and I wasn't ready to go in a corporation. I'm like, I don't wanna work for a corporation. That was like not on my radar screen at all. Uh, but he was very persuasive. Um, <laughs> and he persuaded me to leave this law practice that I had just spent years um, you know, working toward to go to uh, AT&T to do corporate philanthropy, which I'd never even heard of uh, before. Uh, but he was my mentor, and I just I couldn't resist 
the opportunity to work with them. So I, I went to AT&T, spent a number of years um, at AT&T, and then uh, left there and ran a nonprofit uh, theater, as, as you mentioned. Uh, but then I had this opportunity to go to American Express, and I wasn't sure I wanted to go back into the corporate um, world, and he persuaded me uh, right. to go back uh, into the corporate world, and it helped me uh, by uh, giving, a, giving me a reference um, and talking to people and really promoting my candidacy. So he has helped me, you know, through my oh, practically my entire uh, professional career. Uh, and even though I don't agree with everything he says, and we sometimes fight about things, uh, you know. He, He's a really smart guy, and he's really savvy. He's worked in a number of nonprofit organizations, most recently uh, president of the Robin Hood Foundation in New York, before that president of Lincoln Center, before that president of the International Rescue Committee. Uh, and so he's had a really interesting for-profit and not-for-profit background, just like my own. Uh, and so I've really, really looked up to him, and I've uh, learned a lot from him, uh, as well as gotten some good jobs uh, with his help. <laughs> And, and one thing that I'm hearing from that example is just the power of mentorship. And I think there are so many non, not-for-profit leaders who can point to someone who invested or saw far beyond their current situation or circumstance. But what are some of the other ways that you've developed or continued your interdisciplinary training to be the leader who you are today? Yeah, one of the uh, ways of being a parent, uh, actually. I mean, I've learned so much um, from being a parent that I just really didn't get before um, about how you work with people and persuade them to do things um, <laughs> that instead of telling them to do things. I mean, you just, uh, you just can't do that as a parent. Uh, you can maybe do that for a few years, but then that falls apart. Uh, and so you've really got to figure out a way to encourage um, you know, your children to do things and to and to be their guides without them rolling their eyes and you know and ignoring you so that being a parent I think it's been really helpful being a teacher has also been incredibly um, helpful and just working with students uh, and you know when you're a teacher in a kind of a, a interesting role where people are looking to you for the answers but you're not really there to provide the answers you're there to help them learn what the answers um, are and so I think that's again you know how you how you lead you know people is you don't tell them what to do unless maybe you're in the military but you know you you have to really help them do you know the right thing uh, and that's what you're doing um, as a teacher and then just you know a reading I'm an avid uh, reader and uh, pick up a lot through reading and just really appreciate all the readings uh, in in your course here too because I can always learn something new the conversation about being a parent, also the, the type of work that American Express is supporting speaks to generations. Yeah. So when you think about your approach to leadership development, how do you modify, how do you adapt when thinking about the impact of this work on two, three, four possible generations? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to generalize about generations, but, but there are some, you know, some attributes or features of generations that are just different um, from one another. I mean, we have at our company now, we have 55% of our uh, employee base is our millennials. Uh, and by 2020, it will be 75% um, of our employee base. So they're by far, the biggest you know, chunk of our uh, employees. Then we have the Generation Zers coming up, which are my, my daughter is a Generation Zer. Uh, and, and they have a different set of you know, values and, and attributes as well. So uh, I think one of the things that we've learned about you know, millennials that have really taken to heart is they're much more interested in work-life balance than we were as baby boomers. Um, and so we were just we're at work, 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 uh, and life comes later. Uh, but now there's much more of uh, interest in how you combine those things. And I think you have to be cognizant of that um, as a leader and give people space uh, to have that work-life balance and allow them to work from home if they want to work from home and allow them to you know, have flexible um, hours and allow them to have different interests. And we, by the way, as a company, allow our employees to volunteer with nonprofits for as many hours or as little hours as they want to as long as their manager uh, approves it. So we have no set um, guidance there. And so that's all part of uh, allowing people to be flexible uh, in their work uh, environment so that they can have uh, a life 
um, as well. So, you know, that's, that's one aspect I think we've really taken heart. As the point of balance, I've monopolized a, quite a bit of your time. I want to open right. the floor for any possible questions. Uh, for None from Richard. <laughs> Question. I think there's Mike, yeah. And if you could just say your name and your organization. Carol. My name is Kartika. I'm from Indonesia. And I represent Rachel House. Um, it is an organization that provides special medical care. We call it palliative care for children with HIV, AIDS, and cancer. Uh, my question is, I'm wondering maybe if you can share with us how you measure your, uh, the success of your CSR program, uh, given that uh, American Express is a financial institution that I can imagine measure the success based on a lot of quantitative uh, indicative, you know, uh, measurement perhaps yeah. or any other uh, numbers. And secondly, how do you uh, convince to your uh, shareholders um, that the the returns or the effort that you give through the CSR program really worth the investment yeah. that you give? Uh, great so, questions. So when I uh, came to America Express 12 years ago, we were, the, uh, were, were housed, uh, my office is on the 48th floor of our building, and right around the corner from us, uh, there's a group called the Strategic Planning Group. Uh, and the Strategic Planning Group, they're all MBAs, they've all, uh, and MBAs who have had experience in consulting firms, so in Bain and McKinsey and whatever. And they do this for business units. Like they figure out what the scorecards, they call them scorecards, or measures of success, should be for business units. I'm like, great, these guys can help us do that. Right? So I went, I met with them, and they were all enthusiastic because they're all millennials. Uh, and they were <laughs> like, this is going to be great. They're going to you know, help us come up with a scorecard to measure our success. They had a few meetings. You know, a month later, they came back and they said, oh, this is like the hardest thing we've ever done. Uh, they, they came up with nothing, really, that, uh, after a month of work, in fact, it was even more than a month, they came really up with nothing. Uh, and so that's when we decided we were going to have to figure it out ourselves. Um, and that's why, why we then decided to focus on, you know, the nonprofit partner and helping them um, achieve a success and then figuring out a way to harvest that information and report on it. But in the meantime, what's happened, so that was from a philanthropy standpoint, but in the meantime, what's happened is corporate social responsibility has become so broad, you know, it's really about how the company operates. It's not just about what we give away, you know, from a philanthropic standpoint. So, you know, we've now had to tackle things like, you know, our, our impact on the environment, you know, our carbon footprint, you know, supply chain management, you know, diversity and inclusion, I mean, all kinds of, of different aspects of the company that we may not be directly responsible for managing but we've had to work with our colleagues to come up with goals uh, that we're gonna have as a company and, and make them public um, goals so that we can then report on whether we're successful at achieving those goals or not. So just for example, we set a goal um, in 2011 to reduce our carbon footprint by 10% globally. Um, and you know we reduced it over a five year period and we reduced it working with our real estate people and our operations people, we reduced it by 37%. Wow, um, and now we've reduced it by 50%. Um, and so now we have uh, goals to reduce our waste uh, as a company. And so we, we set a goal of eliminating all single use plastic, for instance, from our uh, facility. So, uh, you know, <coughs> things like coffee stirrers and straws and single use <coughs> condiment packages and all that kind of thing, we've now eliminated from our facilities and our airport lounges, and we're gonna take that a step further now. We've committed to uh, producing a credit card made out of recycled plastic from oceans, recovered from wow. oceans. So we've started, you know, all over the years, we've, de we've developed these goals, which we then have to measure our success against those goals, and we report annually through our CSR report whether we've achieved those goals or not. Um, so that's, that's, you know, so it's been an evolutionary process and will continue to, to evolve, um, but it's, a, it's an operational thing, you know, it's a, how you operate um, as a company. The, and the second question, I've now forgotten, what was the second part of that question? How do you convince your shareholders? Oh, how do we convince our shareholders? 
I have to say that I, we've been really, really lucky uh, that you know a lot of companies talk about corporate social responsibility as part of their DNA, but in our case, it's actually true. Um, and so it really has been part of our culture for many, many years, long before I got there. Uh, and so we don't have to do any convincing. Uh, our executives can, were convinced a long time ago. Our shareholders went along with that a long time ago. Our employees went along with it a long time ago. So if anything, we have to kind of hold them back a little bit, you know, because people want to get out in front of the company and, oh, well, why don't we do this, you know, or why don't we do that? And so everybody's got an idea about how we could do something that's more socially responsible. Um, and some of them are really great ideas and we embrace them and some of them are crazy um, ideas and don't, don't make sense from a business standpoint. So one of the things that we find ourselves doing sometimes is we have to talk about the business. Like, we're, we're there to talk about the community and corporate social responsibility, but p people get these ideas, these kind of nutty ideas that they think would be great for the community or for the environment or whatever, and we're, have, we, we're the ones that have to say, hey, does this make sense from a business standpoint? Like, what's the business reason that we're doing this? We get the, what the, you know, the environment, well, what's the business reason? So we kind of you know, have to step into a role of moderating of uh, you know, saying, hey, the whole reason that we're doing what we're doing is we're trying to marry the, what's good for the business with what's good for the community. And so you know, we were talking about that yin and yang thing you know, earlier, that that's, we're in the intersection there. So we want to do things that are good for the business, and we want to do things that are good for the community. And so we're constantly in that intersection. And so we have to promote both. We have to say, hey, everything we do has to be good for both. It has to be good for the company, and it has to be good for the community. Other questions up front? Thank you. My name is Claudine Aute. I'm the representative of CARE in uh, Nigeria. CARE is uh, a development and humanitarian organization uh, which works toward um, gender justice and also empowerment of women and girls. Yep. It has been an I inspiration listening to you. I think I can, s and it's maybe it's similar to you, stay here all this afternoon listening to you sharing your experience. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that's the case, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said earlier that uh, a leader is someone who um, managed to have with him or her people who decide to follow him or her or who are assigned to follow him or her. Can you please tell us from your experience how you managed to turn people who were assigned to follow you to be become your true followers, especially with American Express, where you were recruited to bring some change. How yeah. did you manage to succeed yeah, in doing it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I have people on uh, the small team, used to be bigger, but we've gone through lots of restructurings. Uh, but in that small team, we've got people who were recruited from outside the company, like Richard. Um, we've got people who were from nonprofit organizations. We have some people who were working in our office when I got there, uh, or people that we've recruited from inside the company. So of the 10 people that are part of my team, two of them have been there for 30 years uh, wow. in our office. Um, it took a while uh, to, to bring them on, bo on board uh, because you know they were used to doing things a certain way and used to a different leader and so it took a long, you know, time. But they're, you know, they're definitely, you know, on board, and they're definitely committed to to what we're doing as part of the team. But I also had to get rid of some people, um, and that's, the, I think, one of the hardest things to do as a leader. And one of the things that, quite honestly, I'm not very good at. So I've, that kindness thing gets in the way. That Christianity and kindness. Um, and so I want to be kind to people and give them every opportunity um, you know, to succeed. But sometimes they just don't have the right skills or they're just not in the right position. And sometimes you have to let people go. And I had to do that um, at American Express. In order to create the leadership program, I had to get rid of a different, another program. And so the people that were working in that program, I had to get rid of in order to bring Richard uh, and somebody else on. Uh, and not blaming you know, Richard, but, <laughs> but that's, but that's what we, but that's what you had to do because they didn't have the skills. They didn't have the skills or the background that I that, or the gravitas really that I, I needed, and that is a very difficult thing. And I had to do the same thing with the nonprofit 
uh, that I ran, you know, I got in there, and even though I had been on the board of directors for many years before I became the executive director, I had no idea what was going on, really. Um, and there were just some people that just didn't have the right skills or the right attitude. Uh, and after giving them a certain period of time to adjust, then I had to get rid of them. And I think that one of the things that I don't do very well is I just, you know, I wait too long. You know, I wait too long to do that. Uh, and I, I should do it much faster than I do it, but I just, I just can't, you know, I just can't do it. And I, when I was struggling with this at American Express, I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a documentary filmmaker, Rick Burns, and I uh, was having lunch with him, and I was, oh, I'm, I'm agonizing over the fact I had to I really have to get rid of these two people. They've been with the company for 25 years. They're beloved you know, people, but they just don't have skills. He said, Tim, you have to be ruthless in your pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I, I'm not sure about the ruthless part, <laughs> but I, I get where you're coming from, and yes, I have, I have to bite the bullet. I have to do, do it. You know, if, I, if I'm going to have an excellent team to do the things that we need to do, I'm going to have to bite the bullet and, and do it. But it's, uh, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. Another question over here. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, so I'm Jason Reed. I'm from Second Harvest Heartland. It's a hunger relief organization in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So my question is, um, so when you uh, began your job, uh, you aligned your vision for the foundation with the vision of your CEO, Ken Chenault. So now you have a new CEO. Uh, how are you uh, sort of uh, aligning as or adjusting yourself uh, to, to the priorities and visions of your new CEO? Yeah, well, I'll tell you next year. Um, <laughs> It's, yeah, it's a tough, tough one. Our CEO was our CEO for 16 years. He was a beloved, you know, uh, uh, leader of the team. He had a certain, you know, point of view about things. It was very, very supportive of our work, uh, and particularly the leadership program spoke at all of our leadership academy programs in New York and, and also some in London and Hong Kong. Um, Steve Squarey, who's our new CEO, uh, luckily has been one of our foundation trustees. Um, for many, many years. And so he's been involved in all of those decisions. He's very aware of what we do. We are now you know, getting him involved in our Leadership Academy uh, program, which he wants um, to do. But I can't say it's his passion, where it was, his, uh, work, it was Ken's uh, passion. So you know, we're, we're working through that. Um, he's you know, tweaked our values a little bit. He's tweaked our sort of mission uh, as an organization. Uh, you know, as a, as a company, and so we're, and we have a new brand uh, campaign that we just launched, and so we're tweaking some of the things that we do to be more relevant to our new brand campaign and to this new, what he calls a framework for winning, because I, I was talking at our table, we're still focused on winning, like we're a very, very competitive um, organization, and so we're focused on winning as a company, and so how do we fit into that winning structure? Uh, those things are all yet to be determined. I, I have not, some of you may think this is a great thing. I, I don't, actually. We only meet with our trustees once a year. Uh, I, I think that's not often enough. We need more, more meetings. Uh, but right now, it's once a year. And I haven't had that trustee meeting yet. It will happen in the fall. So you know, we'll see. At that meeting, it will be the first meeting that Steve is at as the CEO rather than as the vice chairman, which is what he was at the time. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see what happens in that meeting. But, uh, you know, I think we, again, you know, that got to be focused but flexible. You know, we've got to be focused on what our end goals are and nobody's suggesting that we stop supporting leadership development or historic preservation or community service, which are other program um, areas. But we'll probably have to tweak what we do uh, as, as we go along and there'll be some things that he'll want to do and, you know, we'll, I'm, I'm flexible. Right, because it's not, it's not the Tim McClyman Foundation, it's the American Express Foundation. It's not my money, it's their, you know, it's the company's money. Um, and so if I can, can help tweak what we do and still achieve success, it's what we do by, and also do it in a way that our senior executives are still with us and our CEO is still with us and we're still supporting the company, I am happy to expend the company's resources, you know, in pursuit of, you know, some of these, these programs, but I have to be realistic enough to know I've got to do it in a way that makes sense 
for everybody or I'll be out of a job and somebody else will be uh, in that job. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm also a survivor. Uh, and you don't work for corporations for as long as I've worked for corporations or any institution for that matter without being a survivor. You know, so I'm, I'm a survivor and we'll do what we have to, to do, but we'll do it with integrity, you know, and we'll do it in a way that people trust what we're, we're doing and we'll do it in a way that really has a positive uh, impact on both the company and the community. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Now's your chance. How do I get a grant? Nobody wants to ask that question. <laughs> 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 Hi, Sarah Eaglehart. I'm the CEO of Native Americans in Philanthropy, and we are a nonprofit that's almost 30 years old that has been in the space with um, working with nonprofits, tribal philanthropies, and foundations. Um, one of my questions is, is obviously you all have seen a lot of different leadership models from a lot of different worldview perspectives. I would love to hear your feedback on what are some of those exciting models that you're seeing emerge, especially like as millennials are coming up and the Gen Zs, like that would be really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that the, you know, the one thing that we see much more of now than we did 10 years ago is the concept of shared leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, that a, a lot of, and again, I don't want to generalize about uh, millennials, but some millennials don't want to be executive directors of um, organizations because they see their former executive directors having spent you know 80 hours a week doing their jobs and they don't want to do that um, so they want to share the leadership they want to be part of the leadership team uh, but they don't want to be the person you know that where the buck stops so that that model of shared leadership uh, I, I think is a, a, a critical kind of next step in the you know leadership ecosystem um, if you will, but it's not easy, you know. I, I mean, I when I worked uh, as executive director of Second Stage Theater, we also had an artistic director, and both of us were equals, right? And we both reported to the board, and we didn't always see eye to eye uh, on things. And even though we were good friends and remain good friends, you know, our staff heard a lot of screaming matches behind uh, our, our doors that we just there were some things that we just didn't see eye to eye on. Um, at all, and so I think it takes a lot of work. It's like you know, collaborations. You know, collaborations take a lot of work. You really have to have a lot of trust and a lot of mutual respect. But you also have to be be willing to get those different points of view out. You know, in the open and work through them. Kind of like marriage in that regard. You got to work through those those uh, problems, um, and you know, those problems expand based on how many people we're talking about. So that's one thing is two, it's another thing is three or four or five, you know, people that are part of a leadership team, like, oh my God. Um, but, but I think that, uh, you know, I think our experience is that uh, a lot of, you know, uh, young leaders, emerging leaders have a much more collaborative point of view, uh, much more community point of view and m more of a sort of crowdsourcing, if you will, um, point of view. We're you know, willing to take a lot of different um, ideas uh, and, and try to make sense of them. So, uh, so that's one thing that I think is really uh, changing, and I think actually for the better, uh, but it doesn't work in every kind of situation or every kind of environment, nor is it for everyone. Some people just you know, can't operate that way, but I think that shared leadership model is really interesting. One last question. Hello, my name is Ty Jones. I'm the producing artistic director of the Classical Theater of Harlem. Uh, could you uh, let us know through uh, American Express uh, what it is that you do, Grant? I imagine you have certain verticals that uh, you guys uh, pinpoint and focus on. Could you let us know what the Yeah, so, uh, so the ones I just mentioned, uh, just mentioned earlier was Leadership development, obviously, is our, our, our main one. Uh, it's our largest program um, area now. It wasn't always the case, but it's, it's you know, developed over the years. And, so, and that's comprised of both the Leadership Academy programs like this, but also we make grants to nonprofit organizations for, the, for their own leadership development um, programs. So that's um, our largest program. Our second large program is our community service uh, program, and it's focused on volunteerism. 
uh, in helping nonprofit organizations utilize, effectively utilize volunteers uh, while providing volunteer opportunities for both community members and our employees uh, as a company. So we're very, you know, focused on, you know, a lot of people think that nonprofit, that you can go volunteer for a nonprofit and that doesn't cost them anything. Well, it does, as you all know, it does cost to have volunteers. Uh, and so we, we fund, you know, volunteer coordinator positions and efforts to, you know, promote volunteering and provide those opportunities for uh, community members. And that program uh, we've had since 1954, actually. Uh, and so it's a long-term, you know, effort. Uh, and our third program is our historic preservation uh, program. And uh, that program, again, you know, you're always trying to find these intersections between the company and, and the community. We are uh, one of the world's largest travel networks. It used to be the world's largest travel company. Um, and uh, historic sites. Uh, are important tourist destinations, uh, and so keeping them open and accessible to the public and preserved uh, fits very nicely with our travel business. And so since 1974, uh, we've been supporting historic preservation um, efforts, and in fact, in 83, funded the first national cause marketing campaign uh, to help restore the Statue of Liberty, uh, and you know, have funded multiple you know, programs since then, so all over the world. So we're really focused on, you know, tourist, tourist destinations and historic sites that are important to communities and neighborhoods and keeping those sites open and, and accessible to the public. So those are our three pillars, um, if you will. And the thing I like about them uh, is that they're sort of cause agnostic. So uh, we don't say as a company that education is more important than humanitarian relief, which is more important than health, which is more important than arts or you know, whatever. Any type of organization can apply for support under those programs. So any type of organization uh, needs leadership development, leaders. Any type of organization needs volunteers uh, and help with that. Uh, and actually any type of organization can own an historic property uh, that needs preservation. So we fund all disciplines, all causes, um, if you will, and that gives us the ability to have a very global program, works very, very well globally uh, for us, and a, a program that is very much in keeping with our business, because we as a payments business are trying to facilitate your payments to do whatever it is that you want to do, right? Whatever it is that you want to buy or whatever, where you want to travel or whatever kind of entertainment, we don't make any, you know, those decisions for you. You make those decisions. And so our employees are able to volunteer for any type of organization on company time. Our employee, we match contributions of our employees to any type of nonprofit organization and our philanthropy is open to all uh, types of nonprofits as well. So it's a very much a sort of freedom of choice um, kind of effort, but in these very specific programs and pillars that, yes, will find, fund any type of organization, but for leadership development or community service or historic <coughs> preservation. Great. Thank you. Tim, on behalf of all gathered here, your team and your partners, as well as the generations who are true benefactors of your leadership and fulfillment of purpose, we thank you. Your journey and transparency is refreshing. And certainly, uh, I have some great takeaways around this interdisciplinary approach, the focused flexibility. Uh, but just to your, we're, our gratitude goes to you because of your willingness to invest in nonprofit organizations and leadership development. So again, thank you great. for your time today. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.